Hello and welcome everyone today to the session. Uh, my name is Misha Brookman. I'm the product manager for Google Cloud Bigtable. And today we're talking with WePay and Outbound about their use cases with big data processing, with Bigtable, Dataflow, and Dataproc. And today, to get us started, we have Sham Madali, Director of Engineering at WePay. Thanks, Misha. Um, I'm Sham from WePay. Uh, before we get into understanding how WePay built its uh, data pipeline, I want to tell more about WePay and what the use case actually is. So we are talking about fraud detection. And uh, WePay, just to introduce WePay to all of you, WePay provides payment um, services to online platforms. Like, for example, if you want to give money to somebody on GoFundMe, uh, the actual payment engine behind that is uh, WePay. So the specific example here we are talking about is FreshBooks. So if you are a um, construction kind of a company, you want to send your client some invoice, you did some work. Uh, so the client gets invoice, now they want to get paid. How do they get paid, right? So that broken kind of experience is you can ask the service provider to create account in another platform, and the client goes and pays over there. It's completely mixed, and uh, I mean, it's not just a broken uh, user experience. So to uh, fix these things, companies start to do what we call integrated payments. So it's in the same flow, they can actually send the invoice and get paid. But payments is hard. It's a very much a regulated space. Uh, there is compliance risk. There is fraud risk. There is lots of other stuff, like working with the payment partners. You, uh, comp uh, card uh, network has certain rules, and so on. Right. So it's a little bit hard. So WePay offers easy-to-use APIs and uh, completely abstract away all the operations uh, difficulties, the compliance difficulties, everything else. So that's what WePay does. And this is how we are different. There are some pl platforms, uh, payment providers in the market space where they give you some user control, user experience control, so uh, you can actually uh, integrate into their, uh, into their flows. The second case uh, is they offer risk protection, but none of them actually do both giving you complete control of the user experience as well as risk protection. So because we are uh, taking the risk, that means our platform has to be good. So just to give a sense of like what kind of risk that we have, as, uh, because we are, a pla we are taking payments from a unknown party like a merchant, and we are, paying out to, um, we are taking payments from the clients, and we are paying out to merchants, there could be fraud on both sides. Merchants could be fraudulent, um, the payers could be fraudulent, and sometimes there is also collusion fraud where somebody can play on both sides of the uh, fence. An example would be a, a bad person could create a merchant account and have a bunch of stolen credit cards and pay himself all the money. And then after a while, the real owner of those credit cards will see, like, hey, I, I did not really pay this service provider. Why am I getting these charges, right? So they will charge back. So the whole thing will be unwound and then we'll try to recoup from the merchant. But merchant is bad, so he's already gone. So we pay, because we offer the risk protection, we have to take the loss. So the risk management piece is very important for us. Right? So uh, because it is very important, and what are, let, let's look at like what, what makes a risk platform great, right? So the fraud, fraudsters are always changing. They are changing their behavior, they're testing their defenses, they are uh, basically uh, adapting to the changes that we make. It's not like a one-time, uh, one-directional move. It's like a chess. We make a move, they make a move, right? And, but they're also leaking a lot of data along the way. They are uh, providing data through the transactions. They're providing data through like environmental uh, data. I'm not getting the exact uh, details of that, but there is a lot of data that they leak in the kind of browsers and all those things that they use. Um, they also... Uh, there is also information in terms of the vendor data. Like we can go look at like uh, third-party vendors, like hey, credit bureaus and so on. What information that they had. So there's a lot of data. We should be able to ingest this diverse piece of data, and learn from it. So we can't directly throw in the raw data and expect the models or rules to perform well. So we need to augment this data as much as we can, so that it becomes easy and apparent for models and uh, rules to uh, work on this data. And then we need to have greater automation. We can't put all of these things in front of uh, a human agents to uh, basically they're like too much, um, too much volume. So you'd be 
it would be very much cost prohibitive to put all of these cases in front of the agents. So what we need is like a high uh, precision kind of a system that catches almost all the bats, but only touches very few good people. That's what we want to build. Now, to enable this, to cut the, convert the raw data from uh, the numbers like the price or the ABS response codes, which is the zip number that you punch in and, uh, at the gas stations and so on. So we can, we can augment this data further by adding geolocation data or we can aggregate on multiple dimensions. Then it becomes clear, hey, this user has been only doing a ASP of, like, say, $100 suddenly he's doing a $5,000 one. It's risky. The models can easily catch on to that, and rules can also easily trigger that, right? So this is the is a toy example of like what do we mean by signal engine. Like we have the raw data, we have the third party data that we get from like other sources and so on. We can augment this data um, with the third party data, aggregate on any dimensions that we want, and then feed into the uh, next step of the pipeline, right? So that's, that's the signal engine. That's, that's where we're gonna spend most of our time in and how we build this robust uh, signal engine. So let's look at the goals of such a system, right? So what, what should it do for us? Given that uh, the frosters are always changing behavior, we cannot know upfront all the things that we would want. Like for example, hey, maybe they're all coming from certain IPs at some point, but they'll change their behavior. Maybe we, we, can, we can use the ISP. So we, we don't know all the dimensions we want to aggregate upon right at the beginning. So our platform should be flexible enough that without writing any new code, we should be able to get these aggregations. The next thing is, we don't know what time frames make sense for any specific problem, right? So certain businesses are seasonal, so the seasonality could be quarterly. Some businesses are like yearly, like say if somebody's selling umbrellas in rainy season, that's expected. You don't expect them to send, uh, sell a bunch of umbrellas in summer. So we should be able to do year over year, month over month, week over week, year to date, month to date, any kind of aggregations and arbitrary time dimensions easily, again, without adding new code. And then um, these events are happening, be it in the user's life cycle or payment itself, like payment has it's authorized, uh, it is captured, uh, it is now settled, all those kinds of, they're like, each of these users, merchants, payments go through these own life cycles. So they generate events. And each, each of these events will be ingested into our pipeline, and we want that latency to be as small as possible. If we leave, like, say, a five minute or 10 minute kind of a gap, frosters will just run through that, right? So we don't want that. And uh, the end-to-end -end processing time should be ideally in the order of like hundreds of milliseconds. Um, and at most, when for our system, we decide that one second is the maximum we could tolerate, right? And then it should be easily scalable. Um, if the data is too small, we can do simple queries and uh, group buys and where clauses, you'll get all what you want. But once the data increases and you want the dynamic nature, those simple database kind of schemes don't work we need a different kind of a solution, right? And it needs to be easily maintainable. Again, like it should not be DevOps heavy and so on. So keeping those goals in mind, we thought of what is the abstract data pipeline that would work for us. We talked about events getting generated, right? They're, uh, that's the streaming source. And we want them to go into some kind of aggregation, which is a black box at this stage. We'll get into later, like describing what it is. And we want it to generate partial aggregates, not the real aggregates, but partial aggregates, so that we can assemble them in runtime to decide what's the right time window, what's appropriate for us. And then we should have some kind of interface where users can say, like, these are the dimensions I care about, this is the time window I care about, and we get the responses back. So being a cloud-native kind of a company, thought, like, what's available at Google Stack to uh, actually materialize this in real world? Right? Misha, can you help us understand what are the components available for us to make this happen? Thank you, Sean. So before I get into the details of the components available on the Google Cloud Platform, let's talk a bit about the history of Google and where it comes from. So Google started off to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And for that, Google built the search application. 
Now, the search application obviously has a lot of very specific components that are tuned and geared for search. But even with that, there are a number of generic big data problems that Google had to solve to enable the search application to run at the scale of the internet. So for one, we needed to be able to store the large amounts of data that would go into the search pipeline. And we needed to have different types of storage systems depending on the type of the content that we would be storing. And that might involve file systems, databases, or other storage systems. Once we have that data, we need to be able to process it. And we need to be able to build the search index from all of that content. That may take the shape of either batch processing, if let's say we need to build the link graph of the entire internet. But we also need to have real-time stream processing to capture all the updates happening in real time on web pages that change every second, every minute, as opposed to the things that stay constant and static for months and years at a time. And finally, we needed to be able to serve this data and serve this content and be able to upgrade our applications, such as the search application, live without any downtime. A number of Google products have reached over a billion users. So Search, Google Play, Chrome, Android, YouTube, Maps, Gmail, and Google Cloud Platform all serve each over a billion users using all the common infrastructure. And in fact, all of these applications and all of these services are built on the same hardware, the same networking, and also the same software stack that powers all of these individual applications as well as available on the Google Cloud Platform. So let's walk through a couple examples of what are the software applications that make this possible across a number of different domains. Over the years, Google has built a number of technologies to support all these various storage product, service products, starting with the Google File System, MapReduce, Bigtable, Dremel, Colossus, Spanner, and others. Google has built a number of generic systems from storage to processing to machine learning, as well as container management to enable all these applications to operate at scale despite their various differences and their domains. And now, all of these services are available as part of Google Cloud Platform, grouped into various areas such as compute, storage, databases, big data, machine learning, and others. So let's walk through a couple examples of these that maybe will be useful for the team at WePay. So for one, you know, the, the question was about you know, serving our users through the search application. So how would we run containerized workloads such that we can upgrade and deploy and scale all our applications very quickly and easily? So Google actually wrote the support for containers in Linux and open source that as C groups, but we also needed something to orchestrate the services and to be able to upgrade them. So we wrote Borg, and then we open sourced the Kubernetes container manager system, and now we provide a managed service around Kubernetes as Google Container Engine. Container Engine provides cluster management and orchestration. It provides a private container registry, and it uses declarative app resource specifications that it will enforce for you at runtime. It also provides auto-scaling to meet the needs of applications. We also needed a file system that would be able to scale to the size of the internet as well as grow with the size of the internet. And we needed to store all the data from the growing internet as well as all the other applications that users might generate. So we first built Google File System, and then we upgraded that with Colossus. And today we provide Google Cloud Storage, which is an exabyte scale file system. It has high throughput. It has replicated through regional and multi-regional buckets. It has a uniform API across various storage uh, classes. So you can either store cold data, warm data, hot data, and access them uniformly through the same API. So you don't have to change your code to be able to access the different types of storage. It also has an HDFS compatible connector, so you can use it from Hadoop without changing your code at all. Once we have all this data, we need to be able to process the data at scale. And as I mentioned, we need to be able to process the data both in batch mode as well as streaming mode. Over the years, Google has written a number of different systems, such as MapReduce, Flume, and MailWheel. And we've combined all of those into Google Cloud Dataflow. Then what we did was we open sourced the SDK behind Google Cloud Dataflow as Apache Beam. Apache Beam recently became a top level project in the Apache Software Foundation. And you can run code that uses the Apache Beam SDK on top of other execution engines besides just Google Cloud Dataflow. You can also use it on Spark and Flink. Dataflow, as I mentioned, combines both of the models, both batch and streaming. So you don't have to rewrite your code to go from batch to streaming. The same exact code will work in both modes. So you have instant portability, and you can make the decision of how to deploy the code. And we'll see later how WePay uses that to their advantage. 
Dataflow provides auto-scaling and dynamic task sharding, so you don't have the problem of the long stragglers taking a very long time and slowing down your overall process. When Dataflow notices that the tasks are taking too long, it will break up the tasks, reassign the work, and spin up additional workers if it needs to to make sure that your job is complete quickly. Dataflow provides connectors to various storage systems, such as Bigtable, BigQuery, and Cloud Storage, so you can read and write from anywhere to anywhere. And as I mentioned, it is portable with the Apache Beam SDK. So we also needed a way to run open source processing engines, such as Hadoop and Spark. And so for that, we wrote and provide Google Cloud Dataproc. Dataproc provides Hadoop, Spark, Pig, Hive, and other big data components. It also provides connectors to Bigtable, BigQuery, and Cloud Storage. What this allows you to do is that you can run stateless Hadoop and Spark clusters. This means that you can bring them up very quickly and turn them down when you, need, when you don't need to use them because you're using Bigtable, Cloud Storage, and BigQuery as hosted storage solutions. This also allows you to do something very different. It allows you to think about your processing as jobs rather than think about long-lived clusters. So rather than saying, I need to run a cluster, I need to maintain a cluster, you can just submit jobs using the Cloud Data Proc API, and it will make those clusters appear, it will grow them, and you can then turn them down. In addition to the batch storage, we also needed very fast storage at petabyte scale. So what happened specifically with search is that some pages, as I mentioned, get updated very, very quickly while others take days or weeks or months to be updated. If we always build our indexes in batch mode by rewriting large index files, we'll always be behind and we'll have a very stale search index. So what we needed was a database that scaled to the petabytes that gave us random access to every single data item in the database very, very quickly. And so for that, we built Bigtable. And now that's available as Google Cloud Bigtable as part of Google Cloud Platform. And I'll go into a bit more detail about what is Bigtable, how it works, and what it makes possible. So Bigtable is a NoSQL database. It's a fully managed service. It provides petabyte scale and storage with low latency access to any item in the database. It provides seamless scalability for throughput, and it learns and adjusts to the access patterns. Let's do a deep dive into the last two points. So the Bigtable schema, it, it provides a sparse, NoSQL white column database. What this means is that if you're not storing data in some of the cells, that does not count against the storage. Bigtable provides a single index, which is the row key. So row key design is very important when using Bigtable. And it provides atomic single row transactions across all the columns. The best way to think about Bigtable is as a three-dimensional spreadsheet. There are rows, columns, and every cell has timestamp versions. Now, those versions are in 64, so you can consider them as time. You can also use them as arbitrary version IDs. So each of those intersections there can have multiple versions. At a high level, clients connect to a single endpoint, which then dispatches a request to the various Bigtable nodes. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to remove the load balancing and proxy layer for simplicity to show the actual connections and how they will be forwarded from the clients to the processing nodes. But always remember that there is that load, pro load balancing proxy layer so that clients don't actually have to have a discovery service to find out which node they need to connect to and when. So one interesting thing about Bigtable is that Bigtable, even though it's a database, is actually a stateless system. So Bigtable doesn't actually store any data. All the data that is stored in Bigtable is actually stored on Colossus, our distributed file system. This is actually true for all other Google storage systems. This is something that Bigtable, Spanner, and BigQuery all share. So let's say we have a particular Bigtable node that is managing a bunch of data on Colossus, and all of a sudden, the data that it's managing is becoming popular with the clients, and so they keep all accessing it. So now that node is getting more activity and more requests than other nearby nodes. Bigtable will notice this and automatically rebalance the data such that the load will then spread to other nodes and it will even the load distribution on the cluster. This happens transparently. The clients are not aware of this. As I mentioned earlier, they go through a load balancing layer that proxies these requests to the different nodes. Now what happens here is that the data doesn't actually move from a Bigtable node to another Bigtable node. The data stays continuously in the Colossus file system, all that happens is that we're reassigning metadata of the assignment of the data from one node to another. So this is actually a very fast operation. 
It does not take size of data. It takes seconds or less. What this also allows us to do is that it takes, it allows us to scale the cluster both up and down to provide more throughput to the data. Because reassignment is really, really quick, what this means is that we can add more and more nodes to the cluster, and they will share and split the responsibility for the data management in Colossus, and it will be seamless. Again, the clients will not notice. They will just get higher throughput to the underlying data. What this does provide us then is that because the nodes are able to quickly reassign and manage data separately, and the nodes don't communicate with each other. There is a background process behind the scenes, which is the big table master node, which manages the assignments. This provides us with linear scalability in throughput to big table. So whether you have three nodes in your cluster, 30, or 300, the processing power is directly proportional to the number of nodes. And so this allows for linear scalability in performance. Many storage systems tend to flatten out and, and then limit the scalability as the cluster size grows. Not so with Bigtable. In March of last year, we presented a use case where a customer used 3,500 Bigtable nodes with 200 data flow workers of 32 cores each, and it also scales linearly at that scale, and we've tested it with larger clusters beyond that as well. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to Wei from WePay to continue the conversation about what they used. Yeah, thanks, Misha. Uh, Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Wei Li. I'm the engineer leading the uh, data aggregation pipeline at WePay. So uh, in this section of my talk, I'm going to go some technical deep dive into how we set up the data pipeline and uh, the challenges that we have facing and the, the architecture decision that I made and uh, also show the problems that we deploy to production and at the end, uh, we'll share with you what we key takeaways from our implementation. So let's come back to the technical goals. So when we start, we want to create a data pipeline. It essentially can aggregate on any dimension and can answer problems for arbitrary time windows. So these are the feature requests. Actually, we are going to go into more detail when we're doing the implementation. And the next three is about the end-to-end -end processing time, less than one second. So this is more like a performance. And uh, we did some upfront testing, and we are going to tell more in the uh, architecture uh, analysis as well. And the last two requirement is why is the easy scaling? Uh, because we are facing the issue that we're having right now, the old database system cannot hold up the traffic, and uh, easy maintainability. So these are crucial for us to uh, go to a large scale production, but uh, engineer-wise, it's actually pretty challenging. Because when we are talking about easy scaling, means that uh, we want a system which can go up really uh, as the same time that our traffic is growing. So, and the easy maintainability, that anybody has the experience with the data pipeline setup would know that uh, probably it would involve like a batch and a streaming, which is really hard to maintain. So those are hard technical questions. And uh, WePay, WePay is actually a startup. We actually bound by the resource, but our business is growing. So we want to get the system ready fast. So that's where the Google come into picture because uh, they have lots of good stuff, like uh, I brought this slide from Misha, like uh, different aspects for the competition. So we are going to look uh, into this uh, choice and uh, combine with our like, uh, WePay uh, setup to see what we can do to set up and uh, create converting the abstract uh, pipeline to a more concrete implementation. So here's the slide that we have earlier for the, our abstract uh, architecture for real-time pipeline. So potentially we have four components, the streaming source, aggregation engine, and uh, aggre partial aggregation storage, and then the uh, customer query UI. So in this, I will go component by component to see why we make, what decision we made, and uh, which component we pick to use. So first off, the streaming source. So we actually look at uh, two different components, uh, Apache Kafka and the Cloud pops up. We started with the cloud pops up. Uh, we did the performance analysis, which proven well. But 
VPay is uh, actually using a lot of Apache Kafka inside our system over a technology stack, and it's uh, widely available. So given that the two components have similar functional features, but uh, VPay is, uh, the ecosystem is more inclined to the Apache Kafka, so that's why we eventually end up using the Apache Kafka. And so the final outcome is that we're actually hosting the Apache Kafka using the computer engine inside Google Cloud. The next com component that comes in mind is the aggregation engine. So the component we look at is the cloud data flow. So like uh, there are lots of good stuff from the uh, data flow features, which is supports the, easy to support the data transformation, and uh, more importantly, has a unified model to, for both streaming and the batch processing. So, which is actually really important for us when we think about this uh, uh, architecture when we're trying to make it more operational. And also, one, uh, another outstanding feature is uh, it ha handles the event time processing. So, which means is that uh, we actually can get deterministic behavior every time we process the events. And also, the strong exactly one semantics is really uh, important for us to get to. Uh, don't uh, duplicate count the events. But uh, mo most importantly is that uh, this is actually a managed service. It scales well horizontally, so it fits in our technical goals that we can scale well. So that's uh, actually our technical choice to use the data flow as the aggregation engine. Uh, the next component we have is the partial aggregation storage. So the component we look at, look at is the cloud big table. As Michelle already said, it's uh, proven to be handle petabyte data scale use case, and also has very low latency in both uh, in terms of both read and write, and uh, it has a native integration with Dataflow, so it's a big table I/O is there. And uh, for our business questions, if we want to time series queries, we have a proper schema design. It will handles really well. And also, most important is that it's also managed service. It can scale very well horizontally. Um, so the last component that we are looking at is the customer query UI. So this is actually our business logic. So what we already ended up is uh, decided on uh, building a REST Java service running using the Docker containers. Uh, the goal of this REST query UI is just acting as the query uh, proxy for the big table to embody our query logic. Uh, for example, the customer stitching logic to answer different uh, customer interval questions. And given that uh, the service is stateless, uh, we can actually scale well really easily just uh, by bumping up the replication to multiple instances. So with all these considerations, this comes down to our concrete architecture for real-time pipeline. So as you can see in the, gra uh, in the diagram here, we collect, we actually instrument all our application code and uh, collect the events when the event's happening and the pump into the Apache Kafka and uh, has a Kafka I.O. streaming the events to the data, data flow processing engine. And then with the partial aggregation, we just periodically output in the big table. And uh, at the end, we have a query service to query that to answer our business questions for the data consumers to use. So the next step comes to is the, what to anticipate if we want to get this production, right? So in production, uh, uh, failure is always happening. We need to be able to handle them and be resilient. And uh, if we you only use one single stream pipeline, uh, it's not robust enough. So the natural thinking is to come to a mixed uh, stream and batch. And this actually fits really well with the data flow. That's why our original thought of why we use this one is that they have a unified processing model for both. Uh, the challenge for us is that uh, Kafka I.O. by default is uh, streaming I.O. So if we want to set up a batch, we need to do some customization on this one. So the good thing about us is that uh, our events is actually all time-based. So for all the events, we we actually mandatory to have a custom event time when it happened. So that's, what, that's the base for us to create a bounded Kafka I.O. So looking at this example, this uh, example is uh, 
assume that we have uh, 60 events comes in, and uh, all the green ones are coming in at the same hour, and uh, we have some out of all the events comes in. And uh, when in the production, in our deployment, we actually have an hourly batch job which actually aggregates in the hourly interval. So for that particular case, the, our customized bounded Kafka, or what it does is, it will take the range for the hour that it's interested to aggregate, and read through all the Kafka events up till now, and the output, only output the events following is your, uh, the, your interested range. So by doing this, we essentially achieve the batch processing. And uh, with this last problem solved, we actually go to the full-fledged uh, production deployment with all the kinds of variations. So as you can see, this diagram is that in the center is still one line. We have a streaming, processing, persisting, and the query. But we have different flavors of pipeline processing. On top is the real-time streaming, which actually consisting listen to the Afka events and persisting periodically to the big table. Uh, in the finest granularity, I think for us is using minutes. And also for different uh, granularity, we have the hour batch, daily batch, and other batch. Uh, so given that we have the customer bounded, uh, bounded Kafka I.O. setup, so they just uh, take the events and uh, we just deploy one event. It's using one single code base, and it's really easy for us to maintain and uh, manage. So then, with this production test, we can come back to visit our technical goals. Uh, I go about the first two, because the last three we have talked about why we make the decision. So the first two is, for example, one is that we want to do a dynamic aggregation on any dimensions using our aggregation engine. So the first, actually, the history, the first iteration for us is that we are thinking just, okay, every time we want a new aggregation, we just stand up a new customer data pipeline. For example, they are doing customized transformation and uh, doing aggregation. It's actually turned out to not be very flexible because if you want to add one new metric, uh, new aggregation, you want to deploy a new pipeline, that's too hard, right? Operational is not feasible. So what we end up is actually create a linear transformation. It's very simple. So the logic step is uh, uh, kind of linear. So for the first step, we just read all the events comes in, and we just uh, logical window by different customer event time, and then group by the customer dimension, and aggregate elements inside the same group, and output periodically into the big table. So on the right, uh, as you can see, there's a production example, uh, not production, this is actually our testing case example. So this is just, uh, one linear transformation of the DAC of our data flow pipeline. And uh, what's flexible about this is that we actually make the schema kind of flexible. So for example, we have four required tags for every schema. So first one is the timestamp. Uh, this is mandatory. So every event have a time. That's the base for us to play by the event time. And also have a customized uh, dimension that you can provide your own dimension by filling this uh, uh, tag. And also we support customer types like a numeric, uh, which for numeric tag we will collect uh, like uh, what's the minimum, what's the average, what's the maximum, and total and uh, count, etc. So it's kind of additional aggregation on this one. Also categorical, so we're gonna have give you back the like a unique values count for this particular window dimension. And also the geolocation essentially is that uh, in this particular window, what's the geo span of the events happening? So this is the customer types we provided. And for the value field, it's just a serialized form of the value that we can, customer combiner will consume and generate. Let's look at one example, how we make this more, make this work. So one event we are seeing is, uh, for example, is, uh, let's use a, a fake event. So this is a super ABC store which received a $100 payment, origin from the Rebel City, CA94063, uh, uh, on Wednesday, um, March the 1st. So the highlight plays are actually represent different attributes of this event. So one event we can extract from this one is uh, the payment amount, right? So we can generate events uh, for this is uh, uh, like uh, at this time, uh, the dimension of payment amount, we create a numeric uh, metric, which is $100. And after our aggregation pipeline, what we, 
we got the result, we can answer the question like, uh, what are the total process, the payment amount you're seeing, and uh, how about average amount and the standard deviation in the sector? So by doing this, this can doing the abnormal detection. Uh, from the same event, we can also generate another metric, which is uh, like, uh, for example, the payment location. Then we can ch just easily change the type to the geolocation and uh, give it a value. And uh, with this, we can say what's the geo distribution of your payments for a particular merchant. So by combining these two, we have a simple DAG, which means that we have a very stable pipeline. And uh, we have a flexo schema, which means that we can dynamically just uh, add any aggregations. So if you're interested, for example, like Sean said earlier, is for us to change their patterns. And if we see any new aggregation we are interested, we just uh, pump in different things. So when we combine these two together, just we have got a very stable and uh, but still very flexible solution. We can support our fast iteration on the aggregation on different uh, dimensions. So the next technical challenge is for us to come down to the time series uh, queries. So uh, one thing we leverage from Big Table is use the Roki design. So we set up the ways the Roki is that uh, the timestamp is always the first step uh, part of the uh, Roki. So essentially, if you are interested in particular time range, you can filter by the prefix and get results back. And also for performance optimization, we actually create a different column families for different uh, granularity. For example, in the example here, we have minutes, hour, day, and week. And uh, so then when we're trying to answer the question for the customer time interval, so one like a naive solution is that we just go to the every minutes and combine them together. So in the example here, if we want to aggregate between February the 25th to March the 8th, if you go by minutes level, it's too many, right? It's not optimized. Given that we have different granularity uh, aggregation already, so we actually implement this time, time stitching in the sense that we can guess the uh, values from the la largest granular first and then extend to the next level and uh, so on. So we can get all the values, but uh, we can reduce the load to the big table. Uh, I'm sure big table can handle this, but uh, we just don't want to overload it. So uh, the next technical goal is the performance and maintainability. So we have been able to deploy the uh, pipeline to production and for several months, and it's actually performed pretty well and uh, compared to old system. It's also very stable and fast. And uh, in a summary is that the key takeaway for us is that uh, Google Cloud Managed Service actually shield us from those heavy lifting technical challenges such as scaling out and the dynamic resource management structure, we can actually more, put more energy and focus on the business problems, less on building out the infrastructure. Uh, so, and also inside VPay, we are using like a uh, lots of components provided by Google Cloud platforms, like such as BigQuery, PubSub, Data Store. And we have a pretty good post on it uh, at vcode.vpay.com. So, if you're interested, you can check it out. And uh, last, I would like to really thank the Google Cloud teams, both Big Table uh, or cloud, uh, data, pro, data Flow and the support. Uh, the, during the process, uh, it has lots of interaction with uh, various teams, and they're really helpful and they help us get to the uh, pipelines up and running. And last but not least, uh, and also I'd like to send all the team members from Repay. Uh, this is not uh, just one project by development; it's actually joined between the operational and the development. Because uh, if you manage pipelines, it's really hard, and uh, we are, both teams are re working really closely to make this happen. So with this said, I uh, hand over the mic to Robin from Outbound. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Robin, and I'm the lead engineer at Outbound. Today, I'll be talking to you guys about on-demand scaling with Bigtable to achieve low latency and high throughput. So first, we started about four years ago, and currently we process about 40 million events, and off of that, one million messages are sent per day. We started with a very simple question. What if you could create and manage any kind of message without engineering help? 
Going off of that, what if you could measure the quality of each message by seeing what users do after they receive it? When I mean any kind of message, I truly mean any kind. Outbound supports email, SMS, mobile, web push, and even webhooks for advanced use cases that we have not covered yet. After you send a message, it's no, there's much more to it than who opened the message or who clicked the link. It's more about the user's journey. What did they do inside of your app after they received the message? For instance, does a churn reducing drip actually lead to less churn? Outbound allows you to do three things. First, decide who you should message by segmentation on user actions and attributes. Second, help you convey your message with a powerful editor and multi-channel support. And third, looking at the report page and see which variant is doing better or worse and adjust the relocation, allocations. So here's an example of our segmentation in process. First, we want to message users living in San Francisco or Palo Alto or Mountain View. And we want to message those who have given us their phone numbers. So the phone number exists in our database. Third, we want to message those who are on a trial. So account type is equal to trial. Our filters are Boolean expressions, and we allow users to chain on ands and ors. Here, you're able to pick the type of channel you want to message on. And if you're not sure, you're also able to create more variants and A-B test on different channels. Say, for example, you want to test on mobile versus web push. Once you, have to pick, once you have picked the channel and populated the message content, you're able to define any goals that you want outbound to track. So in this example, we want users to read more blog posts within one day of receiving this message. And we want users to make more orders within three days of receiving this message. Here, you're able to see a reporting page summarizing three things. One, the number of unique message users touched by this campaign. Two, different variant statistics, including control groups. And three, any goals you may have set up. On our back end, we see about two to 4,000 events per second, and it grows 10% month over month. Our peak to baseline ratio is four to 10 because we have customers internationally. So to be able to sustain this type of usage pattern, we either need to over-provision or set up auto-scaling. Also, per API call, the workload variance has, is very high. It could range from backfilling a user's history to triggering campaigns and goals. Now let's look at a diagram of our backend infrastructure. So when an API call comes in, it hits our load balancer, then it spins off to one of our servers that does minimal validation. Such validations can include, does a track call have an event on it? And does it have a user ID attached? And whether the API key is valid or not? Once this has been validated, it then gets put into one of our various queues. And workers pull items off of various queues. When marketers come in, they usually have a goal that they want to lift in. They would typically pipe their event stream into analytics products, such as Mixpanel or Google Analytics. Then off of those analytics products, they will try to generate predictive indicators. With those indicators in hand, they will run tests to validate it and tune wherever it's necessary. This process is often very lengthy and requires a lot of engineering help and support. Outbound is now able to improve this process by generating ideas for the marketer using their own account's event stream. The marketer now only needs to approve the suggestion and can then go on to write the content without being blocked by engineering. So this is an example of a model for a video subscription company. The goal here is to add more subscription. So the insight is users who verify email and then don't read an article within a day are less likely to add subscription. Based on this insight, the marketer then can target those users by recommending them articles when they verify their email. The ability to generate these insights is where Bigtable shines. Currently, we have over 12 billion events and over 200 million end users. The algorithm to run this job is very joint and very shuffle heavy. However, we're now able to get this down in under three hours. 
Traditionally, without Bigtable, this process would typically fetch from the database, perform some sort of ETL transformation, then store it into a data warehouse so that it doesn't affect production traffic, then perform more ETLs, and once satisfied, we would then put it back in the da database. This process is, again, often very lengthy and requires DBA provisioning. With Bigtable, it replaces all of this. As we need more throughput, we just make an API call to increase capacity. As Misha has previously mentioned, Bigtable throughput scales linearly. So as we increase, increase nodes from X to Y, the supported QPS also goes from A to B. Once our Bigtable instance has been increased, we are now able to run Spark with data cloud proc over it. Once the job finishes, we can then scale Bigtable down. Another way that we use Bigtable is in our compute process. So our backend infrastructure follows a service-oriented architecture, implementing asynchronous queues. And with an API call that can t vary in the workload, queue backups occasionally happen. So we implemented our own autoscaler. It runs off of Jenkins and watches over Datadog. It autoscales off of queue depth and CPU utilization, alongside with other smaller factors. With the number of machines it required, it will either spin up or spin down big table nodes to ensure that our read-write latency is low. Previously, you would have to repartition and add machines manually to achieve capacity, and often over time, oftentimes over-provisioning is the right answer. However, this leads to a higher compute cost, and we're now able to add and remove capacity with just one API call. In the corner there, you can see an example of our autoscaler piping the data into Slack. Products like Cloud Bigtable are one of the reasons why startups are able to be able to accomplish so much with such a small team. These products create a massive leverage on our, the people on your team. I would like to pass it off to Misha now. I would like to thank you, you know, very much for, for speaking. So Robin, Wei, and, and Sham. Uh, this is how you can see how the scalable products that Google Cloud Platform offers that it built for Google and Google services are able to be leveraged by uh, companies to solve their own big data problems. So these generic tools that we built to solve our specific problems are now uh, possible to solve uh, any other problem as well in other domains.